Since the course for the 105th edition of the Tour de France was announced in October, this is the day that everybody has been waiting for. It is the short, big day. It's just 65 kilometres, three mountains to climb. It's the Pyrenees that plays the backdrop. The yellow jersey is up for grabs. And this is the course that confronts them. It starts in Bagnier de Luchon and it makes its way through to the top of the Col de Port de, uh, the Col de Porte, a climb that has been ascended all the way to the top for the first time. It's only 65 kilometres. It starts with the Category 1 climb of the Perigude, then it's on to Val d'Oron Eze, and then it is on to the Col de Porte. This is a brutal 65 kilometres. Hello and welcome to stage 17 of the Tour de France. Matthew Keenan and Robbie McEwen with you. Robbie, Bagnier de Luchon is tranquil for now, but not for long. Well, it's all calm before the storm. And one of the big questions is, will we get one of the storms that's on the forecast? It's bright sunshine, extremely hot, especially on this final climb. The stage is incredibly short, incredibly dense. We have to mix things up to keep the teams on their toes. There's always a friendly contest between organizers and teams to make sure the race isn't too predictable. This 65 kilometer 17th stage with three big climbs is uphill from the word go. Good warm up is uh, yeah, what we also do for uh, uh, time trials to start the stage as, uh, as good as possible. And it will feel like a, like a time trial, uphill time trial from the, from the start on, but then with a big bunch. Super tough, you know, short obviously, but three big climbs and it'll be a big challenge. I think there's going to be a huge fight for position at the start and then it'll be full gas until the finish line for the full 65 kilometers. We're expecting a lot from this stage. It's ideal for attacks, especially in the GC battle, to win the Tour de France. We believe the shorter format will make the attacks more intense. The riders will be lined up in a starting grid similar to that used in MotoGP. At the front will be the top 20 riders with their starting places dictated by their position in the general classification. The yellow jersey, Geraint Thomas, will be at the front of the grid occupying a pole position. The rest of the field will start in groups of 20 behind them, again determined by the riders' at GC positions. There will be a warm-up area next to the start, which should give the fans an interesting show before the stage gets underway. The riders sign on will end 30 minutes before the start, giving them time to warm up and then position themselves on the grid. From there, the action starts immediately as the riders tackle the climb up the Col de Perisord as soon as the flag is dropped. You know the roads here well, Robbie, in Bagnier de Luchon, and then the roads out. They head straight on to the Col de Perisord, which is a tough climb. It's within one kilometre that they start going uphill. Do you think the grid start will have any impact on the outcome of the day? Not really. Nor do I. I, I think what it does do is it eliminates anyone complaining afterwards of... I missed the split because I had to start down the back. So they're lined up in order of GC where they should be. It's up to them to hold that position through the neutralised zone and they'll, they'll start in the right spot then at the bottom of the climb. So nobody's got any excuses. And I don't think it'll change much because it's effectively the strongest at the front, the weakest at the back. It's actually a bit of a disadvantage for the ones at the back who are further back in GC. They like to start right on the front row so they can hang in for as long as possible and try and back themselves into the Gruppetto as the climb starts. But at least for the better guys, you won't have those uh, guys lower on GC doing what we call the lead sinker, dropping straight through them, straight back through the bunch, getting in anybody's way. And really, this this stage for the, the lesser climbers, for the guys going to be struggling with the time limit, they will be riding a 65-kilometre time trial. And we'll have to wait and see what the time limit's going to be on this stage. 
and that will be a group time trial for survival. So the first 10 riders in the general classification will be staggered at the front, then the next 10 behind them, then in descending groups of 20, down to last place in the general classification, which incidentally in 146th position is Lawson Craddock, the brave American, who's at three hours, 16 minutes, and 35 seconds behind the yellow jersey of Geraint Thomas. The top 10 overall, it is Thomas who leads, so he'll start front and centre, followed then by Froome, Tom Dumoulin, Primoz Roglic, Roman Bardet, Mikael Lander, Stephen Kruisweig, Nato Quintana, Jakob Fulsang, and Dan Martin. In 11th position is Alejandro Valverde. For Team Sky, they have two riders inside the top 10, so too Movistar, so too Lotto and El Jumbo. Here's a look at the gradients on this first climb of the Perisord. You know it well. Can your legs remember just how tough it is? Oh, they definitely remember. It is a very difficult climb straight out of Bagnères de Luchon and a very constant gradient. It's not really steep. Lower down, it's at the, at the steepest. But um, medium gradient, but it's just relentless. There's no spots where it really backs off. There's the graphic. You see down the bottom, got a couple of steep ramps in kilometre three, four and five. That little blue section towards the middle, that's still decent climbing. Don't, don't be fooled. Just at the very, very top, it goes a little bit quicker before the last kilometre and a half. But that little flat section is only because it's a bit of a flat corner before it ramps up again. It's a very difficult climb and there'll be a lot of guys in trouble. But as I said before, you've got to settle into your own rhythm straight away. You can't try and hang on for too long, go completely in the red zone, blow yourself up. You just risk losing more time overall on the stage. So you're not in it for the win. You've basically, you've just got to stay within yourself at what you think your limit is for the whole day. It's a time trial. And that ascent was made famous as a descent by Chris Froome two years ago when he attacked over the top of that climb, descending down into Bagnères de Luchon, when he went on to take the yellow jersey. It's a climb that many of the riders have ridden in either direction, either up it or down it. Froome knows it really well, having done plenty of recon on this climb both in 2016 and in preparation for 2018. He has the yellow jersey right in front of him, Gaudet Thomas, the two teammates. Moby Star with two riders inside the top 10 in the general classification. Then Alejandro Valverde also inside the top 20 in the overall standings. Plus Andre Amador, who is in 15th position. So Moby Star in this grid start formation. They have four riders inside the top 20. It does give them a slight advantage if they've got ambitions to be aggressive from the gun. I guess more importantly than the GC riders being up the front, because they're all together, it's about who maybe has teammates there immediately, who gets teammates a bit blocked further back, the race lights up, and they never get a chance to get to the front in trouble from the get-go. But honestly, they're going to go out of the start here. We're into the neutral section. The race will mix back up again. The riders sliding their way up the side to improve position, get up the front next to their team leaders. I don't think it's going to make a whole lot of difference. There's the weather for today. Sunny at the moment at the start, 27 degrees. 20 degrees at the finish, but of course the finish is at 2,215 metres above sea level. Primes Roglic on the right-hand side of the screen has got both feet already clipped in and holding onto the barricade. Ready to start a criterion <laughs> with three really big mountains. Reminiscent of a Formula One or a MotoGP star, the red lights and it's green. Underway. And it is unbelievably calm. Well, Bardet's got the quickest start and he will lead into turn one. This is precisely what most people anticipated from the grid start. It does create some sense of organisation and clearly it sorts out the pecking order, but as they depart Bagnères de Luchon for stage 17 of the Tour de France, we see the first move of the day and it is coming from Direct Energy and that is Lillian Calmajan. And followed by Pierre Latour immediately. Men have been on the attack a lot already in this tour. Julien Bernard also trying to go across. He's into the wheel now. The Frenchman from Trek Segafredo. So three French riders, followed by the German, Simon Geschke of Team Sunweb, and Adam Yates. No, Mikel Nievi is on the move for Mitchelton Scott. 
Mikhail Nieve, he's the best place rider overall for Mitchelton Scott in 19th position overall. And already they're on to the Monte de Pedigud. A climb of almost 15 kilometres with an average gradient of 6.7%. Bernard at the front, followed by Pierre Roland, Simon Geschke from Sunweb, Astana, it's Michael Valgren or Hansen. It's certainly not Jakob Fulsang. It looks like Hansen. It's Jesper Hansen from the Astana team, followed then by Lillian Kalmajan. And who could it be in red coming across? I won't look, but it's Thomas de Gent. It's Thomas de Gent. This is going to be a really tough day. You've been in this situation take us through it i've been in that exact situation dropped in the first couple of hundred meters of the perisord exactly like arnold damari is now i was just going to say the pace at the front is bringing a tear to my eye thinking of the non-climbers at the back just trying to survive and finish this tour de france arnold damar he's got to ignore what's happening in front of him ride his own pace as hard as he can manage and he knows he's just got to do that all the way to the finish like he did yesterday and he made it so things are looking up He's got to just not even bother looking up the road at what's going on. Just settle into rhythm, breathe, pedal, eat, drink. That's all. There's nothing else to do today. This is a really tough climb. This is a climb that's kind of cut in two in terms of its names. The bottom part of the climb is the Col de Pere Sword. And as they get to what is the top of the Col de Pere Sword, they make a left-hand turn onto the Monte de Perigude. This is a really tough climb. And that left-hand turn you get a moment's respite, and when I say a moment, I mean a moment. It's at a, literally most. a couple of hundred metres downhill. You go over the top of the Perisord, and it starts to go down. You'll reach 70 or 80 kilometres an hour, and then swing left, and you've got to hold as much momentum as possible to hit that next uphill. This is Taylor Finney, number 15, going out the back. He's not on his own. He's got plenty of company. Jacobo Gunnetti is the rider who is with him. That's Janssen from Lotto and Al Jumbo. Janssen speaks multiple languages. Norwegian is his native tongue. He speaks English, French, Dutch, Spanish, and Catalan. So he can work within the group. He's the interpreter. He gets all those sprinters surviving to the finish line. But he was on his own there, so he'll have no one to speak any language to at the moment. While off the front, oh, this is... You can only know the feeling when you've raced the tour and you're almost three weeks into racing and you've got to start straight up a hill. But I could never quite understand how these guys are able to go like this right from the start. It's just literally riding a, a prologue sort of start. Big warm up on the rollers, out of the blocks. And just hope you can hang on to that pace you're setting. A very big group because you see that Team Sky they're not trying to go with the attacks just getting into that rhythm and trying to keep as many riders on board as possible I doubt we'll be seeing Luke Rowe doing a lot of the pace making today more over to the likes of Castroviejo, Walt Pools Egon Bernal Kanga still on his own Astana aiming for a third stage victory they took back to back just before the rest day Kanga he did start the Giro d'Italia this year he was a non-starter on stage 13. He then refreshed after that, went on to the Tour de Suisse where he finished in 11th position overall. Currently sitting in 21st place in the general classification. And off to a very good start on this climb. Marc Soler now chasing for Movistar, followed then by Omar Frale. This is the group with Yates. And not only is this the group with Yates, this is the group with Alejandro Valverde. Movistar, they're on a mission. Well, we've been talking about it with a, a few of our colleagues in the media, mostly ex-riders, guys like Jens Vogt and Chris Anker Sorensen, and who's going to do what and what the possibilities are. And most of us were in agreement that Alejandro Valverde would really be the man to shake things up amongst the, the top 15 on GC. We're talking about shaking things up. Julian Alaphilippe has done that throughout this Tour de France, and he decides this is the moment I'm going across I at least want to take top points at the top of this climb. Make sure of this polka dot jersey because I want to stand on the podium in Paris wearing this come Sunday. It's not an unassailable lead for Julien Alaphilippe, but he has a commanding advantage in the race for that jersey. He leads by 49 points ahead of Warren Barguil. 
Warren Bargill's been very active throughout the Pyrenees, as he was in the Alps. But Julien Alaphilippe to bounce back after yesterday to attack again today. This is Atapuma, followed then by Roman Sikar. We see a number of riders willing to attack because, in fact, Team Sky are using Luke Rowe to set the pace at the moment, trying to keep him on board for as long as possible. I just think at the pace that Luke Rowe is able to set on a mountain like this, we could end up with a very large and very powerful group off the front. Still, Sky won't really react with the next rider in line until they feel threatened by someone high enough on GC to create a bit of panic. We already said Valverde up there, 9.36 behind on GC. That's still manageable for one climb. But I think on the next climb, they're going to start using, maybe even halfway up this climb, start picking up the pace. Luke Rowe, I guess the strategy for Team Sky is lose him because eventually you will lose him. And that's exactly what they're doing. The Welshman, he'd be delighted not just to have the yellow jersey within the team, but one of his closest friends, Garant Thomas, in the overall race lead. Can get still at the front by 46 seconds ahead of the yellow jersey group. Nicola Ede is the man in red who's trying desperately to come across. Life is tough at the back. But it could be worse. These riders are lucky that it's Luke Rowe setting the pace. Not that he's a bad climber. He's, in fact, quite good for a man of his stature. A classic specialist. So these guys keeping in touch very well. They've also got to ride off the time of the group off the front, which now is approaching a minute ahead of the peloton. Because, of course, that is what our time delay is calculated on. The winner across the line, percentage of his time. And later on, we'll get confirmation of exactly how much that is and try and work things out as we go along. It'll be dependent on the average speed of the day. But there will be a special condition today from the commissaires, the race organisers, to give a fairly generous time delay on such a short stage with so much climbing. Miguel Nieve for Mitchelton Scott now trying to bridge across. 53 seconds, that's the deficit he's trying to make up to join the leading group, which includes Adam Yates. So two riders trying to get away for Mitchelton Scott. Kangert. Beyond the stage victory yesterday for Julien Alaphilippe, the big story was Philip Gilbert. And the fact that that horrible crash with Gilbert was just a few hundred metres away from where, tragically, Fabio Casatelli died in 1995, really brought home the risk of the sport the fact that he was able to finish was extraordinary showed just how tough he is that was Kolchikov incidentally of Katusha who's trying to get away from the peloton he has posted a photo this morning on his social media accounts on both Instagram and Twitter of his knee that has the fractured patella it is twice the size of the knee that's not injured how did he finish the stage yeah quite incredible and the swelling that's just taken hold overnight on Philippe Gilbert's knee. Yeah, it looks like two different people laying next to each other. Two completely different legs in terms of size. Well, Ken Gerd at the front has now ridden away from Ede. Ede has been dropped, caught by Philippe, and it's still 17 seconds the gap to bridge across to the leader on the road for the stage. Two riders now for Kafidis. This is the rider from Estonia, riding for the Astana team, Tenel Kangad. Well, what a start for the Estonian. Straight out of the blocks and up the road at full speed as if it's the finale of the race. And, well, it sort of is. 56 kilometres to go. But, uh, only halfway up, or a little bit more than halfway up, this first climb. And just about to be distanced there was Luke Durbridge. So... A good effort from Durbridge this far up the climb. But Kangat still holding off this group with Ala Philippe at the moment. Really impressive. He was in really good at the front of the Peloton. Yeah, it, it does, certainly does. But even they'll be pleased to still be where they are at this moment. No matter who's setting tempo, they just have so many riders around and think, I'm still here. Robbie, they've still got more than 2,200 metres worth of climbing to ascend on a stage of 65 k's with more than 38 kilometres worth of climbing. Well, let's have a quick look at the climbs themselves. So the, the Perry Sword, and also adding on that last part up to the up to Perry Hagood, 14.9 kilometres at an average of 6.7%.
The next climb, Category 1, the Col de Val 7.4 kilometres at 8.3% average. The final climb, it's a killer. 16 kilometres at an average of 8.7%. The first four or five kilometres of it are well above 10%. Really steep, super hot. I think that's what we're going to see some of our, what we've been calling GC favourites, really blow up. A big factor with that climb as we watch Alaphilippe still chasing Kangit, chasing points for the King of the Mountains jersey. A big factor today surely is the altitude. 2,215 metres at the top. It will be. Once you get towards the top and you go over 2,000 metres, that's about three kilometres to go. That's where it really kicks in. You start to notice the lack of oxygen. The air feels thin. You start gasping for air. You would anyway at the top of a 16-kilometre climb at the end of a stage like this, and the altitude just makes it. ...group blowing apart. That was Palazzotti. That is Martinez Yates. Now Navarro, Ede, Rafael Mica, Alejandro Valverde, Omar Frele, and driving the tempo relentlessly is Marc Soler. This is over the top of the Perisord. And they're still a minute and 14 seconds behind Kangert. Often this is the top of the climb. Today it's not. So he gets that very short descent and then he'll flick left. Want to hold as much momentum as possible and it kicks up again really steep at the start of the next part of the peloton. Still a large group, thinning out at the back, and then individual riders dotted down the climb. And they will just time trial their way to the finish, make sure they're inside the time limit. And they can be rewarded with a flat stage tomorrow to pull. This is the left-hand turn. The barricades are in the way. If you go straight, it's a beautiful descent down into the valley but this is a tough section of the climb. It's just a little more than one kilometre. Good to see the Kiwi flag on the side of the road, but this is tough to the top of the Pedagood. Into the department of the Haute Pyrenees. This is the chasing group, and Yates has recuperated somewhat. He's made his way back to the Valverde group. Probably will take his body a little while to get going after yesterday's not just breakaway, but of course that crash. Yeah, really difficult to recover from something like that and be at your best to fight it out for the stage win the very next day. But we'll just know his motivation levels are through the roof after being in a winning position yesterday and never getting to find out if he would have held off Alaphilippe. But that's just, that comes with the territory. When you're pushing that hard, it just comes down to those tiny little percentages and you just pushed it that tiny, tiny bit too hard in that left-hand corner. This is Kangert, almost at the top of the climb of the Monte de Perigud. He's over the top of the Perisord, now onto the Perigud. The points for the King of the Mountains jersey at 21 seconds, 22 seconds behind. Julien Alaphilippe wants those. This is a problem at the back. This is Nardo Quintana. No panic. The front wheel by Andre Amador. All is cool for now. They'll be happy that it's still Luke Rowe who's on the front for Team Sky. This wheel change, though, is taking quite a while. That's Vicente Garcia Costa, one of the sports directors, former top line professional himself. He says, never mind, Andre. We'll get you a wheel. Let's get Nardo going. Close things down. It's all good. I'll tell you what, the push he's going to give Nardo Quintana, that'll get Vicente Garcia Costa's heart rate up. They're sending the wolf. The green jersey, Peter Sagan, still near the front. Julian Alaphilippe, he won't get there, will he? 20 seconds still the gap. No, he won't be able to catch Kangert on the way up. Where's your money on the way down? Oh, most certainly he'll catch him on the descent. Daniel Kangert, he's not a bad descender, but he's not in the same class as Julian Alaphilippe when the road goes downhill. But this is really good for him, having 20-odd seconds over the top. He should at least still be with Alaphilippe when they get to the bottom and start the next climb. That'll be the climb to Valeron. Three big items on the to-do list today. The first one, the Monte de Perigud, ticked off for Tenel Kangertz, ticked off as well for Julian Alaphilippe, who further extends his lead in the race for the polka dot jersey. Juracek in second position, Harada holding on in third. And no time for Harada to collect a bidden from the side of the road. 
these two, Jurasek and Harada, need to stick with Alaphilippe. How calm is Quintana? Well, there he is, on to... Well, the tail of the group that passed him when he was on the side of the road. And so Daniele Bernati, the man bringing him back. So just on to the back of that group with Sylvain Chavanel. And very quickly now, he'll be onto the back of the main peloton. But you want to move right up towards the front as well before they start this descent. They're also sending back Iverti to support him. The challenge for Quintana is to return to the front without wasting energy. Raphael Micah from Bora Hansgrohe. Nose out. To collect a few more points in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. Raphael Micah sits in fifth position in that classification. A few more points might move him a little bit further forward in that competition. Here's a look at the issue with Nato Quintana. He's on the right hand side of the road. Almost a crash for Nato Quintana. Well, has he clipped the wheel or has he hit? He's hit a barrier. That barrier's down on the road behind him. Just couldn't quite foot of one of the barriers. He stopped again. This is the second time for Nato Quintana. So, giving him a push. Another form. It was all by the medical car. Quintana. Well, if you're going to get hit by a car, might as well be the medical car. At least it can fix you straight up. <laughs> it is the right car to be hit by. But Nero Quintana, well, cool and calm enough. He said, no, just give me another wheel, not the one I got from Amador. But you can see he hit the foot of that barrier, obviously damaged his front wheel, so he needed to change straight away. He was uh, lucky to hold it up. And you can see the road, what's coming ahead, it doesn't go straight down. It's not a directly a descent from going through that King of the Mountain point. So he'll ride his way back on again. What he won't be able to get away with, which we see often on a flat stage, is somebody have an issue with the front wheel, they change the front wheel. Yet somehow the mechanic needs to adjust the rear brake by just holding the back of the rider and perhaps accelerating a little. Yeah, no, he won't get away with that one. He won't need it either. He'll be comfortable enough under the pace that's been set in the peloton. Ride his way back on with Erminol Urviti. About to make the tight left-hand turn. You can see Alaphilippe just indicating to Duracek, this one's tight. And Kangert sweeps through it cleanly. So too does Alaphilippe. And Duracek is through safely. And no sign of Harada, who was with them at the top of the climb and, and through the King of the Mountains point. So he has been distanced, the Spaniard from Team Kofidis. And he's not been picked up on the race computer either in terms of exactly where he is. Ludonville is the next town that they'll be heading through, the next major town. And that's where there's the intermediate sprint in the race for the green jersey. But that's an unassailable lead at the moment for Peter Sagan. Longest section of flat road on this stage coming up too. Little bump as they come to Ludonville. That's where the sprint point is after 27.5 kilometres of racing. So some 38.5k to go. It's those switches, and that's where Alaphilippe is nailing it, and where Philip Gilbert made a small mistake yesterday. He came out of one corner a little too hot to get the right line into that next left-hander. And that's the thing, you've got to get the corner before right, so you've got the right exit. So you see Alaphilippe, he'll come out of one corner, and he'll do that almost flick-flack onto the other side. Three riders now out in front. Kangert, Alaphilippe, and Jurasek chasing group of 10 is starting to swell they've been joined once again by Balcom Mollema he lost ground at the top of the previous climb he's now managed to make his way across on the descent so he's gone down well on a short stage today not as many monuments on display this is the Chateau de Moulot what's left of it anyway into the Haute Pyrenees for today's stage Jurasek at the front Kangert now rolling through followed by Alaphilippe. Their advantage is one minute and 10 seconds on the chasing group. It is then back to the yellow jersey, 3.27. It's beautiful lake, what a setting it is. Some of the lakes up in the mountains, like on the first rest day at Lake Annecy as they're about to head into the Alps. And now this one in the heart of the Pyrenees, simply stunning. Speaking of chiropractic work, as we did earlier on with Danny Navarro, it's now a little bit of self-manipulation from Julian Alaphilippe. Three and a half minutes now, the lead of these three riders back to the peloton. 
big group in between. And the first rider behind, that's Jesus Jorada. He is signalled at 37 seconds behind this group. Another 30 seconds back is that attacking group with Valverde, Molima, Adam Yates, Rafael Maika, Danny Martinez, Ede, Freire, Novaro, Pelizzotti, Mark Soler and Mulberg. Be a minute behind this group and they are not far away from the intermediate sprint of the day in Ludonville. Here it is, just 500 metres away, 300 in fact. Not a whole lot to speak of within this town. Beautiful holiday spot. Kanga will collect the points. Jurasek will get 17. Then 15 for Alaphilippe. But their main motivation, it's not the points. It's time. It's to get to the base of the next climb with as much of an advantage as they can hold on to. Well, even if they were to hold this gap over the peloton at the start of the last climb, it's not much. Remember, Stephen Kroeslake and Alp Duez, he started with just over four minutes at the bottom of the climb. 13.8 kilometres was caught 2K to go. In fact, a little bit more than 2K to go. Four kilometres to go. And this final climb is extremely difficult. It's, over, it's 16 kilometres long, over 8.5% average. It's also the Souvenir Henri de Grange. It's the highest summit in this year's Tour de France at 2,215 metres above sea level. The lower part of the climb has been used plenty of times throughout the history of the Tour de France, including in 1981 when Phil Anderson finished third on the stage behind Lucien Van Nym and Bernard Hinault and became the first non-European to wear the yellow jersey at the Tour de France. But today, they turn off the platter day, they keep on going, they climb to the top of the Col de Porte. This is what is about to confront the breakaway. We well, see on that profile, that black section, so after one kilometre, it gets really steep indeed. Average of 8.3%, that middle section, that coloured in black, that means it's above nine. That's nine to 10%, possibly a little bit more in the steeper corners as well, at three kilometres. So it's the shortest climb of the day, 7.4 kilometres, but very steep, and that's the climb where we spoke about the descent being pretty rough and uneven. Perfect spot for Julian Alaphilippe to try and ride these guys out of the wheel and start the final climb with a head start. It's the fastest speed that we've seen so far on this year's tour. A smidgen over 101, I think it was 101.7. 101.9, I'm calling it 102. Now we're seeing some movement at the base of the climb. This is Sylvain Dillier, followed then by Oliver Nazan. The white jersey of Pierre Latour, then it's Roman Bardet. Well, try and set things up, get Sky isolated as possible, and quite possibly, if he's feeling really good, set up an attack on this climb over the top, and I think almost certainly in the descent. They know Geraint Thomas is vulnerable downhill. He's had a few crashes on downhills, particularly in the rain, but they really want to get him under pressure. We return to our leaders, still with a lot of climbing to go. That's a lot of climbing, just a smidgen under 2,000 metres within 35 k's. This is the second group on the road. That was Mark Soler from Movistar at the front. Palazzotti is in here from Bahrain Merida with the yellow number and also the yellow helmet, the leaders of the team's classification. De Ghent is now being caught. Team cars are trying to go forward. This is quick step for Julien Alaphilippe, but the man who's setting the tempo is Sylvain Dillier. Not a man for the mountains. Second in Paris-Roubaix this year. It's sacrifice time for Dillier. Well, the car's going through because there's two minutes 15 gap between the peloton and that group of 12, trying to, trying to chase the group of Alaphilippe. He talked about still about 2,000 metres elevation to climb in this stage. This climb they're on at the moment to Val Laurent, it's the shortest one of the day. And elevation change, some 616 metres over the 7.4K. You look at the final climb. The foot at the former Swiss champion from Aju Désert, Pierre Latour in all white, the best young rider in his wheel. And the back Luke of the Rowe. bunch, they start to slip out the back. Row number seven. This is Sep Van Mark number 18, Daryl Impey, the South African champion. Lawson Craddock, Lawson number Craddock. 13. Yep, good job. Super job by Luke Rowe. This is Robert Hessing, number 162. Jasper Stoven also just slipping out the back, the man who almost won in Monde. 
Jack Bauer, number 62, the Kiwi. Number 74, that's Iveti. The rider with no numbers on, that was Warren Bargill. This is Michael Valgren. Stefan Kung with no numbers on from BMC. Pascal on. Ian Boswell, number 142, in the red colours from Katusha. He is a very good climber, Ian Boswell. When you see Boswell being dropped, the pace is really high, and that is not a peloton. That is a select group. That is a really select group, and still Dillier on the front of that group. Balka Molema has got his hand up for service, but he is being distanced by the group that still contains Alejandro Valverde. But Molema, he's been in multiple attacks. It's got to be affecting him. And his performance on this stage is just so hard to back up day after day, keep getting in the break. This is the group that Molema has just lost contact with as Molberger is driving the pace at the front. So it is Molberger from Bora Hansgrohe riding for Rafael Maker. They're trying to make an impression on this group because they are one minute and 11 seconds behind this group with Julian Alaphilippe. They get over the top with that gap. I can assure you down the bottom of the next descent, it's going to be bigger. Pay the price later on the green jersey. Peter Sagan out of the saddle, looks under pressure. Can he hold on for much longer? Atapuma now caught from UAE. Looks across to his team captain. That is Dan Martin. This is up the front of the race. This is Harada being dropped by the second group on the road. Also, Ede gone out the back. Number 203. Soler. Soler gone as well. Adam Yates struggling with the pace. So there's been a big acceleration here. And it's Mulberger doing the damage for Rafael Maker. So Mulberger giving it everything. Danny Martinez from EF Drepak in his wheel. Rafael Maker, number 114. Then Alejandro Valverde. And finally, the green jersey sprinter, Peter Sagan. Let's go of the group of GC favourites. Phenomenal for a sec from UAE. It is Ken Gert from Astana and the ever, ever impressive Alaphilippe in the King of the Mountains jersey. My call is everybody is going to be chasing Julian Alaphilippe up the final climb. He's then gone this downhill. If he can hold it together, and we've heard about the state of the descent, pretty rough roads, a little bit gravelly, some really tricky corners. But if he can hold it together, I expect him to be on his own when he gets to the bottom of the descent and start this final climb to the finish. Saint Larry Soulin, the Col de Porte. A look at the fight of number 26. Pierre Latour, the leader of the best young rider classification. Just around the corner, this is a group that includes Balka Molema. They're only a matter of a handful of seconds in front of the yellow jersey group. Being led by Marc Soler, about to reel them back in. 800 metres to the top of the climb, and surely there'll be maximum points for Julien Alaphilippe on this one. The gap decreasing for the front group. 47 seconds as Pierre Latour is now being distanced. So the pace setting he's done when that went up a notch by Marc Soler. That has shed the Frenchman. Good news is his closest rival for White is behind him on the road. This is the third group on the road. Balka Molema in the red and white colours. The Spanish champion, Gorka Izaguirre, with the Bushman's hanky, collects a bidden. It's then Visho from Group Armour FDJ, Simon Geshka with the beard, and Pierre Roland from Education First Rapac. Marc Soler still setting the tempo on the front of the yellow jersey group. Molberger. Finally, now that is sacrifice. He is within 500 metres of the top of the climb. He could have ridden a little more conservatively, but he knows that Micah needs to get super close to Alaphilippe if he's to stand a chance. He has put all of his own interests in a whole different suitcase, and he's put his cards on the table for Raphael Micah. Well, I just wonder if that pace that he set before he blew himself to pieces has just affected Micah and put him into the red zone himself and the gap's going to go back out that front group. He got it down to 41 seconds at the moment. Approaching the top and I'm sure Alaphilippe will make an acceleration get the points and we'll pretty quickly see him in the aero tuck. Average speed so far keeping in mind most of the stage has been uphill. There's just been about 12 kilometres worth of descending and the average speed is more than 28 k's per hour. That's obscene. At the front Jurasek is just losing a little bit of ground. Alaphilippe is stretching the legs once more and stretching his lead in the race for the King of the Mountains classification. A day of consolidation for the Frenchman. Two stage wins.
the polka dot jersey is looking ever more secure can get over the top in second Duracek over the top in third it's only a few seconds it could be a minute by the bottom I think it's the last he'll see of Julian Alaphilippe unless he looks up a couple of levels on the final climb to the finish as the, what we saw on the last descent when Duracek was already having trouble following Alaphilippe and he wasn't really pushing it yet what I'm noticing here with Valverde chasing across the top he's only at 30 to 35 seconds behind the spectators on the side of the road have been outstanding today. They have. Well, we're getting down also in that region where we see a whole lot of Basque fans and coming towards the finish today. There were thousands of them. They're fantastic on the roadside, really appreciate the riders' efforts. And it's always a pleasure to ride amongst fans like that. The bus, they don't come for the event, they come for the bike race. And one of the best races of the season in terms of the spectator involvement and their enthusiasm whilst always doing the right thing is the Tour of the Basque Country. Unfortunately for the riders, it's normally really wet and cold at that time of year. And has to pedal as Alaphilippe just freewheels. Again, take us through it and your recommendation to Kanged. Well, your entry's always got to be wide so you can swing across to the apex and then use all the road on the way out. Whereas Kanged, he's coming in narrow, missing the apex, he's hitting the corner before the apex, then he's got to be more on the brakes, still swinging out wide but not able to put any power down, slower out of the corner, carry no speed, losing distance. And again, he was heading into that next corner, which was only a sweeper, too shallow, not going wide enough. And every corner, although the corners themselves are different, the technique is the same, you start out wide, you do your braking in a straight line, you lean it into the corner, follow the line through, through the apex, pedal out, nice wide exit, set yourself up straight away for the next one, swinging back across the road, and Alaphilippe does it textbook. If you want to know how to descend, watch what he's doing, not what Kanget's doing behind him, because pretty soon, I think, he's going to be a lot further behind him. Straight section, Kanget back in the wheel at the moment, Alaphilippe a quick sip. He'll be hoping this descent gets a little more technical and he can get rid of the Estonian every single corner. Look at the gaps open up. He just needs a few tight corners back to back and he'll be rid of him. We've never seen so many Welsh flags on the side of the road at the Tour before. And I'm sure they're yelling, Comedy Ambith. That's the second group. That was the group being led down by Martinez from Education First Draft Pack. Still Marc Soler at the front of the peloton. So two riders out in front at 15 seconds is Juracek. Then we have a group of five at 47 seconds behind. This is Jesus Herrada, who's in Jersey at two minutes and six seconds. 25 kilometres to race. Of those 25 kilometres, 16 uphill. And not just uphill, really uphill. Steep, tough, brutal climb. Back to the front, and Tanel Kangat struggling to stay in contact with Julian Alaphilippe. Every straight piece, he really has to accelerate hard, try and close that gap back down. And Alaphilippe's not really trying to offload him at the moment. He's just cruising through the course. Crash Shoot. for Peter Sagan. We've just heard over race radio, Peter Sagan has crashed on the way down. He's obviously taken some risks to see if he can rejoin the group with the yellow jersey. If Peter Sagan is crashing, you know it's dangerous. And knowing Peter Sagan, he would have been traveling at warp speed. Let's hope he's all right and he's just missed a corner and he's okay. He went over the top of the climb at one minute and 30 seconds behind the yellow jersey group. Shoots Peter Sagan, confirmation of the crash of Peter Sagan. We will bring you any news we get. Fingers crossed, he's okay. And Robbie, with how fast he goes down mountains, that could be the green jersey going elsewhere. He may not be able to finish the tour. Well, we hope that Peter Sagan is okay. We have no other details, but knowing the way he descends and how fast he goes downhill, we can only hope he's okay. But the likely speed he's been travelling, we could be looking at a situation where the green jersey is out of the Tour de France. Let's keep our fingers crossed he's not. Meanwhile, at the front of the race, Kangat, he leads at the moment, which is a better position for him to be in, not trying to chase Julian Alaphilippe. 
And if it is the case with Peter Sagan, and we hope that it's not for his sake and for the race's sake, it highlights why Alexander Kristoff, who's in second position in that classification, has maintained his activity of picking up points, albeit minor placings, still picking up points. You never know. It's a long way to Paris, and we're in the final week. It is Marc Soler. So he is trying to push the pace on this downhill, but when he has to, John just backing it off, not making Chris Froome and Geraint Thomas take any risks through these corners. They don't need to keep up with Marc Soler. Everybody who is of interest to them is behind them, exactly where they want them at the moment. This is a chasing group. In fact, no, it's not. This is Mikhail Nievi. He's been caught by the main peloton, and he's at the tail end of that group. Balko Mollema just in front of him. Third last position with the pink colours is Pierre Rolland. They were up the road, caught just at the top of the climb. Well, a recap of where the groups are at the moment. These two riders in the lead, Alaphilippe and Tanel Kangat, at 23 seconds. Christian Durasek from UAE Team Emirates. At one minute, the chasing group of five with Valverde, Micah, Martinez, Freire and Pelizzotti. Peloton, they are trailing at the moment at 2 minutes and 22 behind Julian Alaphilippe. And they are on a little flatter section. They get a little bit more downhill, which brings them into the valley, which they will cross and onto the final climb. Here it is, the Col de Portet. 8.6% average at the start. The first five kilometres are absolutely brutal on this climb. And it's kilometres two, three and four that really set the tone at around 10% average get up onto the plateau it eases off very slightly certainly not easy and as they get towards the top of the climb look at that over 10 percent average through that final kilometer and it's also the souvenir Henri de Grange as the highest point on this year's race at 2215 meters above sea level there is really that green spot in the middle there's no rest at all on that climb 1400 meters vertical gain in 16 kilometers ridden We're hearing that Peter Sagan is still being treated roadside after his crash. I'm sure everybody has their fingers crossed that the Slovakian world champion and leader of the green jersey competition is OK to continue. But the fact that he's not straight up and back on the bike means that it has been a heavy fall. And we'll keep you updated as we get the updates with our information from Race Centre. This is the second group on the road. Underneath the back, 20 kilometres to race. Palazzotti at the back. Omar Frale was also in that group. Omar Frale of Astana in that second group. He's just sitting on because Kenget is at the front. They're 2.5 kilometres away from the final climb on this difficult 65 kilometre stage. Well, Tanel Kenget. Good news, courtesy of Race Radio. Peter Sagan is back on his bike. That is good news, as long as you can remount. Look, look at yesterday. Philippe Gilbert remounted, made it to the finish, fractured kneecap. Today, he wasn't able to start the race. His left leg, twice the size of his right, and he's out for a number of weeks. Hopefully, Peter Sagan, he hasn't done too much damage, and he'll be able to get through the rest of this day and continue on in the tour. As our two leaders hit the foot of the climb, 16 kilometres to go. Kilometers, most of it at around 10% average. A couple of kilometres a little bit less, but so many steep ramps, really constant, difficult climb. Martinez out of the saddle, back in. The man from EF Drapak, Alejandro Valverde in his wheel. Rafael Maker in third position. Omar Freire just getting distance at the moment. And this is his teammate, Tanel Kungert. And been off the front right from the start of the stage. And he's pushing the gap out over the yellow jersey group to almost three minutes now. And still holding on to more than one minute from the group with Alejandro Valverde, Martinez and Rafael Maica. In the middle, the King of the Mountains jersey, Julian Alaphilippe, at roughly 35 seconds behind, but he surrendered his chances of winning. Well, there's an aerial shot of the finish zone. And just look how open it is. Well above the tree line, over 2,000 metres. Dan Martin with Naro Quintana now. This will catch their attention just a little bit more. Dan Martin, though, at 6.54. Not a threat to the yellow jersey. Nano Quintana at 4.23. They can't afford to give him too much time. Not too much, but they also 
really don't need to panic. And they know they've got the time trial up their sleeves as well. If Quintana, Quintana takes some time. So no big reaction at the moment. Walt pulls for Team Sky, trying to control things, along with Castroviejo. This is not the last day in the mountains as we see Alaphilippe now being caught by the chase group. Friday is another big day in the mountains. Quintana really attacking. There was an attack by a spectator on the side of the road. One trying to control things, but Quintana is not controlling. Quintana is charging and he's dropping Dan Martin. Well, this is a fantastic attack by the Colombian. Something we've waited a couple of years for in the Tour de France. He's been unable to do it. We saw him on Alpe d'Huez on the attack, controlled by Egan Bernal, and then dropped. Has he got more in the tank today? The Colombian checks back, sees he's distancing Dan Martin. In turn, Martin... And that is a big gap back to the peloton at the moment, just being paced by Jonathan... ...to dry with the rest of the team at the moment. Sky not concerned with the move of Nato Quintana. As we mentioned before, is it four minutes and 23 seconds by? It's still Castro Viejo who is setting the tempo. Well, what sort of message does that send to the rest of the favourites in this group? Stephen Kroeswijk, he eases his way out to the side and now up to the front. Stephen Kroeswijk, he doesn't make big blistering attacks, just picks up the tempo to try and edge his way in front, takes a bid on. Maybe not yet for the Dutchman. Can get still holding on to a lead of one minute and five seconds on his chases. He is going away from this group with Alejandro, Alejandro Valverde and Rafael Maker. Omar Freyla has returned to the group, so the pace has come off after they attack each other. This is Marc Soler, and he is now going out the back. His work is done. And what a huge job it was. Big tick for Marc Soler today. Played the role for Valverde. He's played the role for being dropped so to Pierre Roland there's our time gaps a minute and five to the group of Alejandro Valverde Alaphilippe at the back of that group the peloton at two and a half minutes now behind on race minutes behind Kangut screen at the moment still 250 the chases Valverde Micah and Martinez a minute and eight seconds behind. Then Alaphilippe, he's just drifting backwards. Quintana to 2.22. The peloton, a further 30 seconds effectively behind Nato Quintana. He's now caught Martinez. He's also caught Rafael Micah. No, he hasn't. That was Valverde, sorry. I was getting carried away with the Movistar kit. It was Valverde that's with those two at a minute and nine seconds. Quintana is still a minute and 10 behind them. Long time since that team has won yellow. In the past, they have under different sponsors, but with Movistar, they've had high hopes for Nato Quintana. He's won at the Giro d'Italia. He's been second and third here at the Tour. The Colombian accelerates away from Yates. Alaphilippe, that's from yesterday, the crash yesterday. Alaphilippe, he is all class. Yep, great sportsmanship shown and he realises it was made so much easier for him through the crash of Adam Yates. And I'm sure Alaphilippe would have just liked to caught him on his merits and fought it out to the finish. Primoz Roglic, the reaction comes from Froome. What does the yellow jersey do now? This is what Froome has been waiting for. Someone to go that he needs to cover that will give him the distance over Geraint Thomas, which may pull him up the road and enable him in a roundabout kind of way to attack his own teammate. Thomas reacts because others are going for Tom Dumoulin. They're going to go after Froome. We've said it for a few days. Biggest ally for Geraint Thomas in this tour could be Tom Dumoulin. Roglic is fourth overall. Two minutes and 38 seconds behind the yellow jersey of Geraint Thomas. 59 seconds behind Chris Froome. Roglic isn't one to make token attacks when he goes. That's usually it from there to the top. Time trial mode for the Slovenian. Chris Froome in the wheel. Things exploding at the back. Castroviejo gone. Zakarin, he's out the back. TJ Van Garderen at the back of the group. Walt Bulls mid-group. Looks like his work might be done. It's now Tom Dumoulin who's trying to chase Chris Froome. He also needs to defend against Primus Roglic. And Roglic second at the World Championships in the time trial last year. Froome third at the World Championships in the time trial. Tom Dumoulin, the man who's chasing, he was the winner. Roglic 
still applying the pressure. He's not concerned about the presence of Chris Froome. He's taking this one step at a time. Roglic is looking for a podium. He's not concerned about Froome, who's in front of him on GC. He just wants to get rid of anybody he can, at least get closer, rely on his very good time trial on this Saturday and try and get himself into a podium position in this tour. This is TJ Vengada, number 88, with Alaphilippe. Next man, number 41, Warren Bargill. Then Jakob Fugel saying he's in trouble. He had Hansen with him. He's trying to defend his spot in ninth position overall. This is Dan Martin. He has now caught Juracek, who's doing what he can. The leader on the road, though, in the battle for stage honours, it's the Estonian. Can get. Well, the attacking of the GC favourites is bad news for this man. Been leading the race since the get-go. Still two and a half minutes lead, but that is decreasing quickly now. With Roglic on the move, Quintana on the way across, and Roglic, he's hardy. Now the pace behind of Tom Dumoulin. Still got Thomas, Kwiatkowski, Bade, Stephen Kreswijk, Mikael Landa. Kwiatkowski swings out. He's cracked. Bernal is still in contact at the back of this group for Sky. Number six, Walt Poles. Number four is Mikhail Kwiatkowski. At the back of this group, number two, Egan Bernal. 75 is Mikhail Lander. 161 is Steven Kruzvaik. 21 is Roman Bardet. Then it's Thomas in yellow. In front of him is Dumoulin. And he looks like he's getting that gap closed to Roglic, slowly but surely. Perfect for Geraint Thomas to defend against his own teammate, Chris Froome. And does Froome just sit, or does he wait till the game's nearly close and go on his own? Or, still in the wheel of Roglic, bit of tricky camera work getting us excited. It was tricky camera work. Tom Dumoulin, the big diesel, reminiscent of Big Mig. Just finds his tempo, brilliant time trialers. Keep up if you can. Yep, like, much like Indurain, much like Bradley Wiggins in 2012 when he won the Tour. Just riding his way back across the gap. So Roglic, that was a big acceleration, then settling into a rhythm, but definitely put him in the red. Nara Quintana, he now reaches Pelizzotti, goes past Omar Freire, and he has his eyes set on the front of the race. He's almost across to Alejandro Valverde. And he's of the yellow jersey group but he started the day at 4.23 behind and now Dumala has reeled in Roglic and Froome Kruzvaik surely he's the next to go or is it Mikel Lander when they regain contact does Chris Froome try to go again to keep Dumoulin under pressure is he allowed to big question Valverde has been caught by his teammate Quintana and now Valverde he's the one who's playing the role of the super domestic all back together at the front there'll be riders here starting to worry about narrow Quintana up the road riders will start to defend their own positions Bernal now comes to the front to set the tempo but check out Tom Dumoulin he was composed enough to have a gel have something to eat you're within the red zone you're not in the red if you're able to eat that's a good sign for Dumoulin still concentrated still thinking well this around 12 kilometers to go a little bit more for that group of favorites as Alejandro Valverde now sets the pace for Nairo Quintana and they go in search of the leader Tanel Kanga this is Dan Martin he's been dropped by Nairo Quintana but he's still in front of the group of Thomas Froome Dumoulin the right other day in the mountains on Friday Quintana, the Alps, they weren't kind to him. He likes the Pyrenees, they're steeper. And this one goes higher. He's now at the front of the race. As Ken Gertz has been the king of the breakaway, he needs to hold on to Quintana. Has he got anything left? Eight and a half kilometres to go. That's going to be it for Tanel Kangat. Fantastic effort from the Estonian right from the start on the Perisord. And then offloading Julian Alaphilippe. And I think that'll be his chances of the stage win gone. So now Nato Quintana at 1 minute and 10 seconds in front of the yellow jersey group. Kangats is gone. Here's the move by Nato Quintana. From a group moving along at 14, 15 kilometres per hour. 
the attack up to 18 19 20 kilometers per hour it's so hard to get the right level of aggression to then be able to settle into a rhythm and not blow up and he has mastered the arts neutral service providing water for both riders water from the team on the side of the road for Nato Quintana refreshing Vitel for Rafael Mica here comes Dan Martin and Dan Martin really not giving away any more distance to those two in front now has Kanga in front of him he's seen the other two ride through the corner Dan Martin still with eight kilometers to go plenty of time to cross that gap slowly and steadily but the group of favorites are starting to breathe down his neck waiting for someone from that group to go on the attack again Roglic the bravest so far the others content to cover we saw a big move by Stephen Kruisvike on the stage to Alp Duez he paid the price in the end Sky have again complete control four riders at the front from Team Sky two in this group from Lotto and El Jumbo one from Sunweb and then also holding on at the back of that group Kruisvike was there Lander was the rider from Movistar and now we're seeing Dan Martin catching Tenel Kangertz. And this is where the road changes surface. It goes from smooth to rough and a fair bit of gravel. Well, that'll suit Dan Martin. He's as tough as they come. He's rough and ready on the bike, the Irishman. And he's starting to make an impact on this gap. Down to 15 seconds for Dan Martin. Back in the group of GC favourite to the yellow jersey. Still all sky on the front, Walt Pools, Egan Bernal, yellow jersey, Geraint Thomas, Chris Froome further back in the group. There's Froome sitting in third last position. This is Roman Bardet at the back. Number 75 is Mikhail Lander. It's then Froome. Is Froome sticking to the wheel of Roglic? That's who he was sitting behind. It was Primus Roglic who attacked previously. Well, it's not like Chris Froome to ride out of position, away from the team. Maybe just getting a gauge on the others in the group, trying to work out how well they're going, what they might be capable of. We've seen it before with race leaders or defending champions go to the back and lull others into a false sense of security and then launch a winning move. Well, if he is going to launch the winning move and try and ride himself into the yellow jersey, as he had envisioned before this tour started, Better get a move on. Under eight kilometres to go. Geraint Thomas still looking oh so good. This is the front of the race. This is Nato Quintana. The Colombian who's won the tours of Italy and Spain, but never the Tour de France. He's climbed his way now up to fifth position in the overall standings. Still the booze on the side of the road for Froome. Sticks and stones. The booze don't hurt Froome completely open these final slopes through the last six and a half kilometers of this stage gone well above the tree line now and we're just hearing at attack for Quintana Rafael Maker is gone you said it Matt those big gears the beginning of the end the pole has cracked and the Colombian is sailing floating towards the top telltale signs aren't they when a rider is a gear or two bigger than somebody he's off the front with that was not so much an attack by Nato Quintana just a maintaining a brutal tempo he takes a peek backwards he likes what he sees he's only got a minute on the group of Froome that is not a big gap they're still within about 350 meters of the leader on the road we're just hearing via race radio before Quintana attack then drop maker that most combative rider of the day goes to Tanel Kangert, the man on the attack from the start been caught and dropped but what a ride from the Estonian from Astana not a hard decision was it that flag you see on the left the white flag with the blue stripe and the red star that is another one of the flags from Spain that one is from the Galicia region but it's a Colombian who's off the front Nato Quintana it's hard to believe that Nato Quintana is still just 28 years of age he finished second in the Tour de France at his first attempt way back in 2013 second then in 2015 third place finisher in 2016 he's won the Giro and the Volta 
This is the one that's missing, and this is the one that he dreams of. Dan Martin now, he sees Quintana riding further away. He'll have his eyes set on Rafael Maker, trying to use those stepping stones towards the front of the race. This is Kangat, the most combative rider of the day, Alejandro Valverde in his wheel. And they are almost going to get picked up now by the group of the yellow jersey. Walt Poles still at the front. This is Froome at the back of the group. So too is Tom Dumoulin. So too is Roman Bardet. Distance on the road, Dan Martin, just over 150 metres behind Naro Quintana. The group of the yellow jersey where Roman Bardet is struggling now in going out the back. Almost 420 metres behind the leader on the road. Bardet, he looked okay. This tells another story. He's dropped with the pace of Watt Pools. Never a good sign when the saliva reaches from the tip of your chin all the way down to your chest. Bardet has been under pressure and now he has cracked. When you start to get to these altitudes, that's where there is absolutely no hiding anymore. It's that drip that makes the bucket overflow, the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's the 1% less oxygen in the air that makes the favourites crack. Now Dan Martin, he's losing ground on Nato Quintana. He's out to 26 seconds behind. This is Walt Poles at the front, followed by Egan Bernal. Chris Froome at the rear of the group. Just in front of him is Tom Dumoulin. Valverde is still holding on this group for Movistar. Mikael Lander is there, just adjusting the earpiece. Primus Roglic and Steven Kruzweig, the two men from Lotto and El Jumbo. Bardet already at 10 seconds behind the yellow jersey group. That's the danger zone. His chances of a podium slipping away quickly. And look at the hips rocking and rolling in the saddle. That's the end of the challenge for Roman Bardet in this Tour de France. He sees it riding away from him. Fifth overall this morning at 3.21. He's already passed on the road by Nairo Quintana. And in a few more seconds, you'll see Stephen Kreswijk leapfrog him as well as Froome goes back towards the front of the group and Dumoulin was right on him wearing Froome like a glove still well poles at the front followed by Bernal then Thomas now Froome is up in a fourth position five kilometers at the front of the race that's all that remains for Nato Quintana but it is a super tough five k's Speeds for Nato Quintana with Colombians screaming in his ear. He'll be doing roughly 19, 20 kilometers per hour, perhaps less because the gradient now is 11%. This is Steven Kruisweig. He looks over, it's the human coat hanger. He looks composed. We know how brave he is. We saw that on the road to Alpe d'Huez. And we know he doesn't make big, audacious attacks. They're not huge accelerations. He just picks up the speed a little bit, gets a little gap, lets it open up, keeps that same intensity. And I expected Kreuzweig to start to come into his own as we got above 18, 1900 metres above sea level. So the Dutchman now, he has offloaded what pulls he's done. It's now Egan Bernal who has to react and that was Valverde who was Kruzweig, Bernal chasing, then Thomas Froome, Roglic, Dumoulin and Lander. In the distance, Roman Bardet. Roglic again. So Primoz Roglic, the only man with a major attack so far, makes his second. And Geraint Thomas, effortless, goes straight into the wheel of the Slovenian. Now Tom Dumoulin is forced to follow. Froome. Froome at the back of the group. The gap opens up. He's behind Mikel Landa. It's always hard to read with Froome, but this is genuine fatigue. Froome is under serious pressure. He normally lets go early on the climb, not this late on the climb. And it is a moment where Bernal goes back to the front and tries to settle things down. This could be a chance for Dumoulin. Well, if Dumoulin has already heard that Froome is off the back, he needs to get going if he thinks he's got him under pressure. If Froome is foxing, it's very brave going that far off the back.
Back into the wheel at the moment. Just on the radio. That sounded a little bit panicked. It sounded like Egan. Wants him to ease off the pace so he can ride his way back into the wheel. Chris Froome is in trouble and Thomas is looking so in control. And there is Egan Bernal at the front. He's backed it off and Froome makes contact. Team now... Sunweb, they must know this. They must see it. They've got to give the message to Tom Dumoulin. He can make an attack, see if he can get rid of Chris Froome, solidify a second place overall, break up the 1-2 domination of Team Sky. That's the two-kilometre banner just around the corner. They can't keep waiting. Surely it's time to take a risk. Well, Froome may have been distanced, but Tom Dumoulin also had his hands full to cover the move of Roglic. As Bernal sits up, he's on the team radio, plugging back in. The Colombian is comfortable. Straight back from an ad break at Race Radio, Team Sky, Egan Bernal with you right through to the end of the day. He's making it look so easy. 161, Tom Dumoulin, he's waited, now he goes. Thomas is with him, Froome cannot respond. Egan Bernal is waiting for Froome. It's Thomas that sits behind Dumoulin. Then it's Roglic, followed by Kruisweik. Now it's defence time for number one. Well, Dumoulin, he's had to give it a go, at least get rid of Froome and see if Geraint Thomas cracks. It's looked good till now. We're up above 2,000 metres altitude. The high mountains, third week of the race. New territory for Geraint Thomas. Tom Dumoulin has been here. won it, can he crack him? Who's the team leader at Sky? The road will decide. No, it's Chris Froome. The road is deciding today. The team leader is Garant Thomas. The cracking of Chris Froome, the four-time winner of the Tour de France. He is riding back to back to back Grand Tours and that is catching up with him. Well, many had said it's a matter of time until he doesn't win one, and it looks like this is going to be the time. Dumoulin, he is going to continue with this. Will he get assistance from the two Lotto and El Yumbo riders in Roglic and Stephen Kroeswijk? They've got Froome on the ropes. They've only got 1.3 kilometres to take serious time now. Dumoulin, he's got a time trial to the finish. Flick of the elbow for Roglic. He responds. And Roglic says, yes, I'll have a piece of the action. He accelerates once more. He's fighting for a spot on the podium. Kruisweik trying to hold on. Thomas, so far, he's like the tank engine. Froome, just a few seconds at the moment, struggling to hold the wheel of Bernard. For Naro Quintana, he has 26 seconds on Dan Martin. One minute and six. Status quo to the yellow jersey group and opening the gap to Chris Froome. Here's Martin, he's riding in second place on the road. The fighting Irishman. And Bernal is really having to wait for Chris Froome. Roglic now. He's making the most. The yellow jersey, Thomas. That is some defence by Geraint Thomas. This Tour de France. Chris Froome, he's won four. I don't think at this stage it's going to be a fifth. Geraint Thomas is marking everything. And he's looking so good. Dumoulin is on the defensive. He's into that famous time trial mode once again. Beneath the kite with one kilometre to go. Thomas, could be his moment to get more ground on number 32, Dumoulin. Thomas in the tunnel should get his way back on. Roglic pushing it. Thomas in his wheel. Tom Dumoulin trying to close that gap. Chris Froome staying with Egan Bernal. Naro Quintana, he's done some big damage today on GC. He helped light things up. He's going to get the start to the top five overall. And he'll be a happy man when he knows what havoc has gone on behind him. And Dan Martin, 32 seconds, holding on to second on the road for the stage. Dumoulin has made contacts. Used the tunnel to get back in the wheel, a little bit flatter through there. Rising all the way the line now, and the gap is opening again to Dumoulin. Just a metre or two to the back wheel of Geraint Thomas. Well, Roglic, the Slovenian, he came into this race saying, I'll work out throughout this tour whether I'm a Grand Tour rider or not. I know, know the answer. 
They can see Dan Martin just up in front of them, but this man, he is in the clear. Naro Quintana, 33 seconds gap over Dan Martin. He will not be caught. It'll be on the souvenir Henri de Grange, the highest point of this Tour de France, as Chris Froome sees his hopes slip away. And Geraint Thomas, he is going deeper into yellow, not red. The Welsh wonder, the 32-year-old, he's not just the leader of Team Sky now, he is the race leader. Roglic and Froome, normally at this point defending yellow, now he's trying to get a spot on the podium. Quintana is almost there. The Colombian can afford to smile. It's been a long grimace. There's been so much support for him on the side of the road. It's been a difficult tour for Nato Quintana. Not only the stage win, he'll be moving into the top five. He'll hear familiar cheers from the side of the road. And appropriately, it is at the high point of this year's Tour de France. More than 2,000 meters. That's easy for Quintana. Five years since he's won a stage in the Tour. It is Nato Quintana today who conquers the goal and goes out the winner. All the way to the finish line, maximizing the time gains. Dan Martin. Holding off the chasing group. They are closing in on him. They had just 15 seconds behind the Irishman, but he is going to get in for second. Just could not claw his way back onto the wheel of Narrow Quintana. Final bend for Martin, but it's uphill all the way to the line. He pushes all the way through because he knows behind him other GC favourites have cracked. We hope he can move his way right up the order. Thomas leaves the rest behind. Garrett Thomas is defending by attacking and he's taking more time on his rivals this is the welsh wonder at his very best for garrett thomas but now more than a two minute lead in the overall classification as it's roglic next across the line and then it's dumoulin they cross at 53 seconds. What's the damage for Chris Froome? This is Steven Kreuzweig. He gives up about 10 seconds. 12, 13 to the men just in front of him. Chris Froome is still with over 150 metres to go. This is a big blow for Chris Froome. Tom Dumoulin well into second place on GC. And Egan Bernal consistently looking across the shoulder and waiting for Froome. Number one, the great champion of the Tour de France, the four-time winner, suffers all the way to the line, loses time, and slips to third place overall. Loses about 43 seconds to Tom Dumoulin and Primoz Roglic. The Grand Tour dream for Chris Froome looks over. And he is on the brink of slipping off the podium. The time trial to come, Roglic, very good against the clock, got the better of Froome at the World Championships last year. Zacharin through heavy traffic, got slowed down a little bit. Here comes Rafael Micah, and we are still awaiting the arrival of Roman Bardet. Here comes Rafael Micah, and this is why the climb is at the bottom of the climb. There's just no space. Another brave performance. Here comes Alejandro Valverde potentially the top 10 for Valverde and the size of the gear for Bardet there's no suplex left it's just every last little bit of strength tough day for Bardet lead in the overall classification now for Geraint Thomas will be close to two minutes give or take a few seconds to Tom Dumoulin with Naro Quintana super ride Great team performance by Movistar. And tip your hat to Marc Soler. What a job he did. And to this man, that is David Goudeau, who's gone across 24 by. Great effort. Classification on the stage. Quintana taking the win ahead of Dan Martin. Then Geraint Thomas, followed by Primoz Roglic and Tom Dumoulin. Froome, Lander, Zacharin. Egan Bernal today. Phenomenal. Be back home. 
and back home they're incredibly proud Nato Quintana now up to fifth place overall Garrett Thomas has extended his lead he's now a minute 59 seconds ahead of Tom Dumoulin it's Froome at 231 Roglic is breathing down his neck just 16 seconds behind last year's winner the four-time winner of the race incidentally for the Colombians Nano Quintana's stage victory, it puts him equal on terms with two stage wins with Fernando Gaviria and Fabio Parra. Three wins though for Lucha Herrera and Santiago Botaro. This was the move by Dumoulin that distanced Chris Froome. The deep south in the heart of the Pyrenees, the result sheet is rapidly racing towards Paris. Yesterday it was the Colombian Nato Quintana who won the stage and the Welshman Geraint Thomas confirmed his position at the top of the general classification, extending his lead in the race for the Mayo Jorn. The gateway to the Pyrenees Po on a stage that starts in the tiny little village of Tree sur -Bayes. It's 172 kilometres and it's a stage that includes two Category 4 climbs. Importantly, the final one comes within 18 kilometres of the finish line and may well prove to be the decisive moment of the day. Can the sprinters survive? Hello and welcome to the 18th stage of the Tour de France. This is Matthew Keenan with you, joined as always by three-time Green Jersey winner, Robbie McEwen. Robbie, we're in the heart of the Pyrenees. Po is the gateway to the mountains. One stage in the Pyrenees yesterday that provided so much. The previous day, it was the French that managed to have their success. Tomorrow, another day of climbing. Today, a chance for the sprinters. I think the entire field will really appreciate a flatter day after two really tough mountain stages, even though yesterday's was very short. It was incredibly intense. And the sprinters who have survived until this point, they're presented with another chance. It's a little bit of a tricky one. Always tricky back end of the tour to get everything to come back together for a bunch sprint, get those, those breakaways under control and back in the field. But if a guy like Demar, who struggled through the mountains but made it, that cat four climb with 18 kilometres to go could bring him undone. But there's definitely others who get over it. Christoph, Degenkolb, etc. So I expect it to come together for a sprint here for the 70th time in Paul. It's incredible. It's it's the second most popular behind Paris because of its strategic position to the Pyrenees. And the finishes here have always been so different. Bunch sprints coming in from the north, split up, smashed to pieces coming out of the mountains that sit just to the south of here. It's famously a stage that back in 1989, it was an Irish winner, Martin Early, riding for the one from a breakaway. We might see the breakaway today on a flattish stage. Well, we've also seen breakaways be successful on flat stages finishing in Pau. Patrice Algon, he won here back in the 90s. So did Leon van Bon in a breakaway, a two-up with Jens Vogt. It has been done, and today is a big chance for it again. Most of the sprinters are already home and out of this tour. Who are left, are almost completely exhausted. And a team we may have been able to rely upon to ride go for a stage win number four for a Hansgrove for Peter Sagan huge question mark how badly hurt is he from that crash yesterday he says himself I am I'm hurt but I'm okay and I will start and when asked about what happened he was quoted as saying with a smile I was braking in the downhill, but not enough. Then I was flying through the forest. Then I landed on a rock with my ass. His words exactly. He is on the start line. He will be starting. They're five minutes away from getting the neutral underway. This is a tiny little town, Tree sur -Bays. Just 1,000 is the population. But the local gendarmerie, they are estimating today there'll be 20,000 people there to watch the start. So it is quite a turnout. Last 15 years in the case of Matthew Heyman and Tom Abuda is just simply keeping good company. He's missing a few turns but not through a lack of desire. He wants to get amongst it. This is Jesper Sturver now going forward for Trek Segafredo, followed by Jack Bauer, then Sylvain Chabanel. So we've talked about FDJ marking moves. Well, Mitchelton and Scott are doing the same. Jack Bauer, he follows the move there by Jasper Sturven and just sits in the wheel. Because if that breakaway gets brought back, 
Jack Bauer has the responsibility then to try and get into the and defensively to help his teammates make that group stick. As we cruise in, you know, new one. private chateau that was built back in the 17th century. Nice pool in the backyard, beautiful driveway on arrival, nice gardens as well. It's a beautiful property. Reminds me a lot of your place. Yeah, a little bit smaller though, don't you think? Not quite the case. A couple of square metres. Just a couple. Well, the race has only got a few metres ahead. Well, the breakaway, a few metres ahead of the rest of the race. They are working super hard, those five metres. The race computer telling us that their advantage is still just on nine seconds. Matt Heyman through in the front. Toma Buda from Direct Energy. And the man, I guess, with the short straw is the largest in the group, Guillaume van Kiersbroek, behind the smallest man in the group. So van Kiersbroek, the Belgian from Wanty Group Gobert, very active in this tour. Last year in a long breakaway on the stage to Vittel, solo 200 kilometres, reeled back in. Himself in a good group here, but really struggling to open that gap up because they are just not giving up behind so many teams. Would have been told in the team meeting, get in the break. If you're not in it, keep going until we've got someone there. Don't just sit up. Mountains tomorrow, then a time trial, then it's Paris, most likely a sprint, as usual. It's every 10 or 12 years, we might see a break successful in Paris. But really, for most riders, this is the last chance to win a stage. In third position, Kim Van Kiesburg, who you spoke about just a moment ago, his big breakaway last year. Cast your mind back this year to the stage into Le Grand Bournon. He was in the group alongside Mark Cavendish, Mark Renshaw, some of the other sprinters as well, who made it inside the time cutoff by just 31 seconds. So he just survived that day. And he was the rider from all reports doing a lot of the pacemaking to get that group to survive. We give the red number out each day for the most combative. He's been combative. He's shown real fighting spirit. And now he's a chance to be in the break that decides the day because it's shut down at the front of the peloton. Well, they've just doubled their gap over the peloton now. So a massive chance that it stretches out enough to discourage anyone trying to come across and increasing the speed in the peloton again. So good news for the break. But yes, Guillaume van Kiesburg so close to the cutoff in Le Grand Bournard. Since then, he's been well inside the time limit, riding really strongly for such a big man in the mountains, doing really well. But that's what the tour's like. You'll have your bad days, you'll go really close to the limit. And other days you'll think, well, that was okay. I mean, yeah, hard, I had to really try, but I wasn't in danger. And he's coming through well. He's coming through really well. And now look how that gap is blowing up to 25 seconds. They'll be getting the news from their sports directors of Buddha really struggling on this little rise as Heyman rides away from him, not deliberately, just simply stronger. The Frenchman really struggling to maintain the speed of the bigger men, the specialists of the Spring Classics. They'll be getting the news, though, from their team cars. The peloton is sitting up. Go, go, go. Well, set up to give them 20, 25 seconds, but a little hill like that could be the launch pad for the next attack out of the bunch. So it might just be a lull, not sitting up completely yet. So wait to see when the peloton comes through. If they're all still spread across the road, they're not. There is a counter attack, just spotted in the background through the trees. So they're not out of the woods yet. Until they get two plus minutes that we see them able to relax as again Tom Scully in the pink colours of Education First Drapak is the one who wants to go across. They've been really active well, guys, Education First Drapak. Guys like Set for Mark and Tom Scully, they realise they're not going to win in the mountains tomorrow. They're not going to win the and not going to win in Paris on the Champs Elysees. This is it. It's a one day race. Find a way to win it. If you're not a sprinter, you've got to be off the front. Bora Hansgrohe chasing. In fact, that's Taylor Finney at the front. So the big American, he's made his way to the front. Again, Olivia Legac from Group Armour FDJ. Where do you think you're going, Taylor? You're staying with me. Well, Legac, this is the man the race was waiting for when they went through kilometre zero. It punctured, getting a wheel. So they held the race up for a bit for Olivia Legac. Made his way straight to the front of the peloton. And is trying to control these counter attacks. Keep it just a five man group off the front. Another attack now, BMC. And that looks like Stefan Kung. Followed. This is going to hurt. 
followed by Luke Rowe. And then Olivia Legac again. He's doing an outstanding job, Legac. Set Van Mark in the pink colours with the black shoes. Look at them pounce on him from Group Armour FDJ. Robbie, this is teamwork and it's very best. It's a different type than what we see from Team Sky, but it is trying to deliver the same result, a victory for the team. Yep, not letting the break grow in number, not letting anyone go across. And for FDJ, they just follow these moves. It keeps dragging them closer to the break. It makes the break work extremely hard to get their gap. They'll be gassed later on. It makes the catch easier. So you use two riders from your team to mark these moves around the front of the peloton. Later on, you send up the men who have just been following the wheels, not jumping with the attacks. They will do the chasing. And it'll make five at the end of the day. But they start the climb. 7% is the average gradient. Important man for Cole Brelli in search of that elusive stage win. After he's had two second places, key man, Heinrich Hausler to guide him towards the finish. Get him on the back of whatever turns out to be the best sprint train. Group Armour FDJ, they did most of the chasing on the stage to Valence. They also let out the sprint for Arnaud Demar. He was the first to start, but it was overhauled by Sagan. Longest sprint train left in the, in the tour. Previously that was quick step, but they're missing a few riders now. Gavivia gone. He was the man they were doing it all for. Philippe Schilbert also out. And I wonder if today Max Ricci, the lead out man of Fernando Gavidia, can get himself up amongst it in the sprint. We thought he was up around the front as they came in the last few kilometres. And then it was Philippe Schilbert who made an attack within the last kilometre on that uphill section and was caught with 250 metres to go. But Ricci, maybe today. In that sprint, the best performed from Quickstep ended up being Yves Lampard in seventh position on the stage. It's difficult to pick who it will be for Quickstep. At the moment, though, they've got Nicky Terpsha in. Unfortunately for them, they're down to five riders with Gaviria abandoning the race. So too, Tim De Klerk with the illness. Philip Gilbert effectively crashing out, even though he finished the stage in a Banyan de Luchon. But they have a mount classification with Julian Alaphilippe, and they've collected four stage victories, plus a brief stint in the yellow jersey. That is a really successful tour. Topping off an incredibly successful season for Quick Step. Trees for that team. At the back of the group, he did really well to defend the position of this breakaway group of five. Quite early on, he was up the front, marking the moves, giving this group a chance to get established. Rory setting the tempo for UAE Emirates. Gentle at this point by Rory Sutherland standards. In Van Keesbrook now at the front. Well, Matt, with the gap now at 1 minute 15, this group realises pushing hard from now to try and extend. FDJ, along with UAE Team Emirates, they do want to keep them just over a minute keep it super manageable for them they do want to like a team's time trial with a minute minute and a half start Nikki Terps are there led them across the top of the climb of direct energy kind of tried to sneak that point without looking as if he was going for it nothing to be gained some movement and this was the risk of the peloton being so close to the breakaway an attack now goggle at the front followed by Jesper Sturven two riders from Trek Segafredo Olivia Legac is trying to respond Set Van Mark is here this is a strong strong group of three and this was the risk that FDJ along with UAE were running keeping it so close this is what can happen and I'm actually really glad to see it because this is what they deserve because they're just keeping them too close 
Legac tried to cover it. He has blown. He was covering everything early on. He's been doing the riding on the front. Couldn't follow the pace of Goggle. And look at this. Jasper Sturvin, Sepp van Mark. Rider stuck in between. Is that Christian Coren or was that Atapuma? It was certainly one of the riders from UAE. Now, Sky coming to the front. They don't really need to chase this group at all. They can leave it up to the sprinters. They don't want any more to jump across to this group than it gets out of hand. So I, probably not going to try and chase these three down directly, but just ensure the pace is such that it's too fast for any others to jump away from this group. The team cars on the side of the road, Mitchelton, Scott and Quickstep, they'd be happy to see those three come across. There's some horsepower amongst the three chasing, and I'm sure that Sepp Van Mark and Jesper Sturven, they're not teammates, but they know each other well. They tried early. They may well have had a chat down the back of the peloton. And this is getting close. How about we try and sneak across? And I think it's a great decision. Good on them. I mean, they're taking the opportunity that's been presented by the way that Group Armour FDJ and UAE have ridden on the front. They've just been keeping them too close. It's always been the danger. And it's great to see that there's room to pull it off. But they've got the motivation. Ball. We see a fall at the back of the peloton. Adam Yates, he's been taken down. Naro Quintana is on the ground. Yesterday's winner, Naro Quintana. Lucas Postelberger has also gone down. Amador is waiting for him. Hansen was one of the riders from the Astana team. This is Heinrich Hausler from Bahrain Merida. Everyone's up and okay. Moving away again. Amador back on the bike. Quintana getting pushed off. Jersey ripped open his shoulder. He's gone down heavily. The Amador, problem with the chain as well. Oh, careful with the fingers in there. Quickly trying to get that adjusted. This again, though, is a stark reminder of how quickly the race can change. Here's Nairo Quintana just checking the damage. So looking at his fingers, so hurt his hand. One down on his shoulder as well. Now, this could cause the bunch to sit up the three to get across to the break, the break to take some more significant time, get out over two minutes, maybe three, and then we could have race on. So this could really change the complexion of the stage. Quickly back across Andre Amador to ride in support of Nato Quintana. Sky sitting in second position, well, third spot behind UAE Emirates and Group Armour FDJ. Here's a look at the three going across, I thought. We were about to get a look at the crash with Nato Quintana, but not so. This is Jesper Sturven. Well, I wonder if news is starting to filter through about exactly who has fallen, who's chasing what's happened behind, because that is a tough pace being set on the front of the peloton. I'd expected that then the peloton would sit up because of that fall, especially with GC contender, fifth overall, yesterday's stage. One minute between the yellow jersey peloton and our breakaway group. And there's three riders in between, Goggle, Sturven and Van Mark. And the tempo has picked up with this group too. They've gone from playing that game of cat and mouse. They're now really increasing the speed. The chasers are 33 seconds. They are coming across to them. It would make for a very powerful seven. They're about to go through that intermediate sprint point. Not expecting to see anything from Peter Sagan in the race with the green jersey. He has an unassailable lead and still trying to recover from that crash of yesterday. I see Naro Quintana. He's 40 seconds behind the peloton. This is the three, the counter-attack. Man at the back, Jasper Sturven. We saw him ride so strongly on the roads to Mond. It just caught two kilometres to go by Omar Freire. This is Rory Sutherland on the front. Just poking the earpiece back in from Race Radio. Ludvigsen from Group Army FDG. And that is an intense chase behind those three counter-attackers. That's making it difficult back here for Nara Quintana to get himself back on. It's a sign of things to come with 18 kilometres to go, that final Cat 4. I think there'll be plenty of others in the peloton getting ideas. This is Goggle, the man who started the move. The acceleration on that uphill section for his teammate, Jasper Sturven. He now carries on with Sepp van Mark. 59 seconds, the gap to our leaders. That's them in the distance, those vehicles up the road. These two still trying to work their way across. They're caught exactly halfway between the break and the peloton. And they are working really well together. The yellow jersey, Garrett Thomas. Every one of his rivals has conceded that so far he has not put a foot wrong. This is at the back of the race. This is part of the chase. This is Nato Quintana, number 71. 
Passengers behind him, importantly in front of him, number 73. He is the man for this job, Daniela Bonatti. Look at the damage, though, to Nato Quintana. There's a lot of blood coming out of that left elbow. Skin off the left shoulder. The jersey has been significantly damaged. That was a heavy fall. Well, he saw the pace was on up that climb because there was the re reaction to the attack of Goggle Sturven and Van Mark. So they're going quite quickly. And he's come down very heavily, Quintana. Oh, almost certainly affect him in tomorrow's mountain stage and the time trial if his elbow and forearm is all cut up. But at the moment, he's in relative safety into the convoy. He will make it back to the bunch, assess those injuries, and seems to just maybe backing off slightly here now in the peloton, not as strung out as it was. Peter Sagan up in fifth wheel. The karma figure of Rory Sutherland with the red helmet on from UAE Emirates, he looks like he's trying to back things off ever so slightly. And just Luke Rowe in the middle there, just bumping the BMC riders that let me through. I'm going back in and I'm going to take control of this situation from behind. That was Stefan Kung, the rider from BMC, getting the Welsh welcome. Not quite the Glasgow kiss, but just letting him know who the boss was at the front. Liverpool kiss. A bit further south. Just 30 seconds in front of the peloton. But I think the tactic of Group Armour FDJ, along with UAE Emirates, is quite a dangerous one for Arno Dumas. Because the way it's looking, the group will be dragged back before that last Category 4 climb. It will be just enough at this end of the Tour de France for riders with the freshest legs to go on the attack and a sprinter like Demar to be distanced and a whole day and an opportunity like this one could be thrown away by them, I think, just being a bit too greedy too early. I think they're panicked under the fatigue. They want to have complete control the whole time. And here come the two chasers. Set Van Mark and Jesper Sturven, still a little conversation. The charge from the peloton, only a handful of seconds behind them. And getting involved in the sprint, John Degenkolb over the top. Pascalin also there from Wanted Group Goubert. Sagan showing himself at the front, not sprinting, but showing everybody that he's okay. Crashed heavily yesterday. But he's okay. Yep, maybe just a tester of the injuries for Peter Sagan. Alexander Kristoff was also up there just in front of Peter Sagan. And Nairo Quintana is just about to get back on to the tail end of the peloton. Yates is there with him, number 61. 53 is Heinrich Hauser. Jesper de Boost at the back of the group. More Citrons. And they've done a good job of forming the logo. It's a simple logo, but it looks nice. No time for the logo when the race is on. It's still 96 and a half k's to go, 96 kilometers to go. Heyman, the shake of the head. What's happening behind? Yeah, Heyman, a man with his experience, can't understand what's going on and understand the tactic being employed by Group Armour FDG and UAE. And they will just about be rolling onto the back of Sturven and Vermark. And you saw those two when they came through the sprint point look at each other, a little bit of a discussion. Do we keep going? Are we about to get caught? What should we do here? Nara Quintana, medical attention. Quite a lot of blood on the arm, so he's really opened himself up. And what looked like being a really straightforward day in the wheels has turned into something that could, com could compromise. All the work he did yesterday, dragging himself higher up on GC. We saw the class of Nara Quintana yesterday. When he was off the front with Raphael Micah, just sitting behind him, not once did he look to Raphael Micah to contribute to the pacemaking at the front. He just figured, I'll do my own thing and I'll ride him eventually out of the wheel, which is exactly what he did. It's tough at the back, even for Thomas to get number 174. Just in front of him is Goudin. And number 67, Darrell Limpy, South African national champion, still looks so relaxed. The climb won't cause any problems for Darrell Limpy. In fact, if anything, an opportunity for him to move up, get towards the front.
could be a long way to the front from where he's sitting at the moment, but you know he moved up two weeks ago now. <laughs> that stage in Deschartes. Uh, looks to be spending a bit of time there with Adam Yates and looking after him. Maybe just guiding him through. And Yates will be thinking about getting in that breakaway tomorrow. To try and take the stage. The last mountain stage of this tour through the Pyrenees. Thirty-nine seconds the gap now with twenty-eight kilometers to go. It's now inside forty seconds, down to thirty-seven seconds. There's been an incident, and this is a mechanical problem on the right hand side. For Christophe, Christophe Laporte. Laporte, it is Laporte. I figured it would be Laporte, given that a teammate has waited with him. Laporte is the. It was just a mechanical problem, so no crash. It nearly was. And was... there was a rider that threw a bidden, and it has collected Nicola Erday. There could be a consequence for that. Tom Steeles. That was a very nearly an accident caused by the Cofidis rider stopping for his teammate, but not pulling to the edge of the road. And obviously a rider had the bid on in his hand and was going to get rid of it, but quite obviously targeted the coffee disc rider who nearly caused that pile-up. Well, famously back in the 1990s, Tom Steele's threw a bid in a sprint and did get disqualified from the tour. What's the problem? The mechanic asks the question. Christophe Laporte still with plenty of time. There's no need for panic. His teammate at the front, Anthony Perez, now surely stops setting the pace because he'll want to wait until Christophe Laporte returns to the front of the peloton. Otherwise, they're wasting the energy of their team leader. The purpose for them, having done so much chasing of this breakaway group of five. One kilometre to the top of the climb. And it's after the top of the climb, ironically, where it gets even more difficult. You have that sense, OK, through the car win point, this should be all right, but it pinches back up once again. Six kilometre plateau and then another nasty little climb before descending down into Po. This is Guillaume Van Keys book. Well, at the moment, no one willing to go on the offensive in the peloton either. So FDJ doing exactly what they need to do at the moment for Arnaud Demar. Riding close to his limit on this climb. And they are doing that tempo that is nullifying any attempts for somebody to attack from that main peloton. Perfect. It's really important for Arnaud Demar to be able to maintain that tempo that discourages attacks, but he can stay comfortably enough in the wheels of his teammates as it just kicks up a little bit more. Guillaume van Kiersburg on the front. Still on the front. Then Durbridge sitting just behind him. There's the peloton. You can see the red colours of Jesus Ferrara leading the main field. Van Kiersburg Durbridge, Heyman, Buda and Terpstra. They all deserve a red number tomorrow. But it can be only one. Well, very evenly shared. Van book he is the man who started the move. He was the very first attacker of the day. See if anyone feels like going solo. See if they can hang on a little bit longer than all the rest. And he's been doing so much pacemaking. We're splitting the hairs trying to decide who it is. At the moment, it would be Van Kiesburg, but this is the attack. It's Simon Clark who goes. Jack Bow behind him. Then Dan Martin. Good attack by Simon Clark. EF Drapak tried earlier in the day so hard to get in the breakaway. Clark tried. Van Mark also tried to get in it. They had Van Mark go with Sturven earlier on, and they're not going to leave this race today without having tried absolutely everything. Top of the climb, Van Kiesburg leads them over, but the breakaway's been closed down by a split in the peloton led by Simon Clark. There's a number of riders from Group Armour FDJ who have gone with the attack over the top. So where is Arnold Demar? I would say he's got to be sitting a little bit further back unless he's feeling exceptionally good and he's just followed the move. In that group, David Gudo, Arthur Visho, and looks like Rudy Malar, the three riders from Group Armour FDJ. Clark is coming across with fresh resources for Mitchelton Scott and Dan Martin. Jack Bauer, the big Kiwi for Mitchelton Scott. Dan Martin may well be prepared to work 
as Sky now are doing the chasing. Dimension Data also present at the front of the bunch. Actually, Dimension Data, two riders on the front, the bright green helmet. They are riding for Edwald Boss and Hagen. The junction is made. The break has been caught by this counter-attack led by Simon Clark. It's got passengers in the riders from Group Armour FTJ. Ben Kingsbull has just been caught still on the front. He's the red number for mine. He yep. has been super combative. Mine too. He's got to be. He's put so much into it. And he says, if you're going to catch me, I'm going to make you hurt. He is definitely making them hurt. You can see the European champion, Alexander Christoph Durbridge, Bauer. Four riders in this group from Group Armour FDJ. Luke Durbridge slotting straight back in as well. Got Jack Bauer here now as a fresh man. He's done a turn again. Try and help his teammate. Things starting to split though. The fatigued riders from the day. Good though. Back to the front. Shakes his head at Jack Bauer. Mm -hmm. This is not the instruction. But they've got a quick finisher in here. It looked like Uneri has it made does. the Italian. Coming back together Getting though close. from behind. Dimension Data doing the work on the front of the peloton. Guineri is the lead out man for Arno Demar. If that group did survive, which it won't, but if it had it, it would have been difficult to beat. All four of those riders from Group Armour FDJ at the front of that group. Shop's closed. The break can't go. We're waiting for Demar. And now everything is back together, led by Team Sky the rest of the way across the gap. Makes it difficult for those teams of the sprinters now, again, to control it. One rider we have not mentioned today so far, Edvel Bosenhagen. Dimension data, well, he's a rider that we've not spoken about much in the last few kilometres, but Bosenhagen is certainly a chance. This is Arthur. Made a quick look at the finale once they get past the Auto route and into the streets of Pope. There's a number of roundabouts to negotiate their way through. Between five and four kilometres to go, two big roundabouts, passage on the right hand side. At 2.2 to go, smaller roundabout, passage left. 1k to go, there's a sharp left hand corner, brings them under the triangle kite, the red kite of one kilometre. Then it's a big roundabout passage left, and then another left bend, brings them onto the final straight. And the straight is 550 metres long, so positioning important before you get to the kilometre. There's three bends in that final K. On the topic of positioning, it was less than a minute ago we spoke of Peter Sagan in green, caught deep in traffic. Peter Sagan in green, in the box seat on the wheel of Maciej Bodner at the front of the right-hand side. Behind Sagan is Daniel Oss, and behind Oss is Alexander Kristoff. Peter Sagan is not riding just to finish the stage today. He is riding to finish, and that is to finish first. King of the Mountains jersey, Julian Alaphilippe. He will wait until tomorrow. Peloton all together with 11.8 kilometres still to race as they're about to descend into Po. Any individual attacks now will be so difficult to be able to hold off the peloton because the speed is up over 50 k's per hour and it will not let up until the finish line. Well, it's about to get a whole lot quicker when they leave this plateau. They've got two kilometres downhill. This will bring them up around 75, even 80 kilometres an hour as they dive down towards the edge of Po and then inside the final 10 kilometres. It's a very long lead out from Group Armour FDG. I just wonder if they're going to have enough riders left over for the sprint for Arnold Demar. Because I think the other day in De Valence, they were just one man short. They need to go a little bit further at high speed. The last man got Demar to 250 but started to slow. Caught Gilbert. Demar had to go long from outside 200 and got run down by Sagan and Christoph. Marcus Burkhardt moving through to the front. So to Peter Sagan, Alexander Kristoff is up towards the head of the peloton. Kristoff Laporte in the red colours of Kofidis. The red for Bahrain Marita, Sonny Colbrelli. It is a day for the sprinters who have survived. Race organisation, Race Radio, have just announced that Luke Durbridge will be awarded the red number as the most combative.
I disagree. Well, maybe that's tracking the amount of work done Possibly. on the front throughout the whole day. And towards the end, certainly, Ankirs, but was really active and making a great impression. Every one of them is deserving of it. Yeah. I just thought Van Keesbrook was slightly more than the others, but we are splitting hairs. Look, Durbridge does deserve to get a red number. They all do. I'd suggest Durbridge trims the side off his red number and cuts it into four pieces and gives that to the other guys who are in the group with him. They can just stick it onto their number. This tells the story, the speed at the front. This is Lawson Craddock, last on the road and last position in the general classification. Now the shuffling. It looks like Lotto, Suldal coming to the front. Jasper de Boost. Yeah, Jasper de Boost. He's a chance. He's the man who is here to assist Andre Greipel, getting in position for the bunch sprints. De Boost is fast. He survived this long. It's a good chance to ride himself into the top ten. And for him, hopefully a lot more than that. Group Armour FDJ on the right-hand side. They get themselves back to the front of the group now. The downhill is behind them. And all on flatter roads all the way into the finish. These wide roads, it makes it so hard for any team at the front to hold their position because it's an opportunity for others to sweep around the outside. If you're not moving forward, you're going backwards. The breakaway killer today, 155. This is the big sweep, Tobias Ludwigsen. He can just let the race go. Tune into race radio, cross his fingers and hope that it's Arno Demar who wins. And it's the team of Demar on the left of picture, coming around the outside. Hit this roundabout on both sides. The left and left was quicker. Slightly quicker. You could see it on the way in. There was more roundabout to the right, so you've got to take a, a wider turn. They all swing back across into the wheel. It was Bora Hansgrohe on the left, of course, taking the best line through the roundabout. The wind the direction wind all at in the form. moment. Well, changed a little bit coming in from the side. Most of the day it's been blowing up a northerly wind, at least here along the finish straight. It will be a tailwind sprint, high speed, and it won't hurt you to go from a little bit further out with this tailwind. It's quite breezy here in the centre of town, funnelling through the buildings along this finishing straight. Something good for Edwald Bossenhagen. Likes a long sprint, and the tailwind will help. Number six. Doesn't matter about time loss. You can hang out here, think about tomorrow. But at the front, much tighter turn. Bodnar at the front. And did you note on the inside, the Belgian national champion, Yves Lampart, moved right up behind the yellow jersey of Garant Thomas. This is one of those moments where it's a lot tighter and more technical than it looks in the race book. That was just, in the race book, a normal roundabout. Straight ahead, threw it out the other side. Tight turn, strung things out, making it a bit harder to get up to the front if you're a little bit too far back at this moment. Education first, Drapak getting into the mix. Taylor Finney is the rider who's third in line for them. He's got Seth Van Mark and Tom Scully with him. Strong combination of three. But is Taylor Finney fast enough to sprint against Christoph Sagan and Demar? Yves Lampard up there for quick step. We saw him sprint a few days ago. He's got Max Trichese with him, so he looks like he's going to have a go today. The lead-out man of Fernando Gavidia, who's no longer in the race. And Groupama FDJ with Arnold Demar. This is the furthest back they've been for the last 60 kilometres. And a move up on the left-hand side. Sonny Colbrelli has got himself in a position just in front of the green jersey for Bahrain Merida. Heinrich Hausler is there in front of Colbrelli, looking good for them. Demar now has a bit of work to do with his teammates. Try and follow the move around on the outside, our off picture now. Bora Hansgrohe is still in control. Marcus Burkhardt, Oss, he pushes Mulberger. No, Bodnar back into position. The green jersey, Peter Sager, has let go of his teammates. He's drifted back a little bit. He probably figures they might be on the front a little bit too soon. And he's back now on the wheel of Sonny Colbrelli. In front of Colbrelli is Christoph. You see him in the all-white right through the centre. The pink jerseys of EF Drapak, very prominent. Back towards the front now is Groupama FDJ. Back in position, looking good again for Arnold Demar. Can't afford to get swamped and drift and lose position now. Coffered us up the inside for Christoph Laporte. It's Marcus Burkhardt on the front, followed by Maciej Bodnar. It's then Daniel Oss. The red helmet to the left with the white jersey. That's Kunda Court for Degen Kolb. Still waiting for his moment to court. Now the green jersey. He's up onto the wheel of Taylor Finney. Degen Kolb is a long way back. He's not with the court. Degen Kolb is in about 28th position. 
That move then by Peter Sagan. One side of the peloton through to the other, slots in to fifth position. Through the two kilometres to go out of that roundabout and a long straight to the last real corner. And they'll do a 90 degree left hander and come under the kilometre to go. Bora Hansgrohe still in control, 56 kilometres an hour, winding up towards 60, Bodnar. Bodnar can hold this for a kilometre. You can see the lead out men. Guneri is looking over his shoulder. Arno Domar, where are you? Here I am. I'm on your wheel. Let's go. Laporte in the centre in the red. He made a mini sprint, just improved position. Peter Sagan in the middle, just shoulder to shoulder with Laporte. Moves past him. Edouard Bossenhagen on the right-hand side, about 10 back. Just sliding past the AG2R rider. The court about to get out of the way as he just drops off. Degenkolb, who's the second in line from Trek Segafredo. Jasper Sturvin, he's the first. White jersey, red helmet now to the front. And Degenkolb drops in behind Group Armour FDJ. He's onto the wheel of Demar. This is that sharp left-hand corner, which will bring him under one kilometre to go. The Scud leads them through. The missile from New Zealand. It's Tom Scully who is on the front. They're underneath the kites. It's time to sprint for glory in Poe. Scully leads in fourth position. It is Christophe Laporte. Arno Demar is the second of the riders with the blue nicks on. Well, a number of riders caught out of position here. Peter Sagan, he's quite a long way back at the moment. Cofidis go full in the lead out. Laporte very well placed. It's now Jasper Stoven who goes up. Guarnieri poised behind him with Arno Demar on the left of pitcher. Edward Bossenhagen with a teammate. Final bend. They're going to straighten up. They'll see the line from here. Bosenhagen, he's on the wheel of Jan Rensberg. Is Sturven leading? Laporte is waiting. Guneri now opens up. Demar is also poised. Christoph is a little bit further back. Sonny Cole Rally trying to get into the mix. The French fighting at the front. Demar goes. Laporte is with him. The team has been working all day. They've waited desperately. The moment arrives. It is Demar. He gets the job done. It's celebration time for Group Armour FDJ. Full responsibility for the race. It's champagne flute. That is a huge win for Arnold Demar. Got himself through to this stage of the tour, through the mountains. They rode all day long like they did to Valence. The lead out was to perfection. Got himself in just the right position. Was brave to wait long enough. He felt the presence, but it wasn't coming from Laporte. Little gesture, but he knows it didn't make the difference. Arnold Demar, a French win for a French team. It was a long time coming, but this is a big one. Goosebumps all round in the commentary position. Absolute textbook all day long, and the pressure would have been building and building. And doesn't he enjoy that one? A shout from Laporte. He felt that Demar moved off his line. Nothing in it. It didn't inhibit his run. Demar claims the victory. It is his. This win today. Think just how many times. Most of us thought he was gone in the mountains and wouldn't make it through. He survived, and today, with all the pressure, he won. That's better than his win last year, and last year's was really good. Well, as the tour goes on, you know the chances are running out. The pressure just continues to build. And in a situation like today, the fatigue, your team riding all day, the long chase, the stress of coming into the sprint to get it just right, not let all that work go to waste. A number of others got out of position. Christoph came from a long way back. Boston Hagen, Peter Sagan looked too far away with 500 metres to go. And Arno Demar got everything just right. Laporte was pressuring, hoping for Demar to fade. Not happening. Knowing that this is a result, Demar, Laporte in second, Alexander Christoph, Edouard Bossenhagen, Colbrelli, Max Ricchesi for sixth, Degen Kolb, Peter Sagan in eighth, a good result after a big fall yesterday, Finney ninth, and Timothy Dupont for Wandy Group Gobert rounding out the top ten.